Conversations for Health, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based cutting-edge research, and practical tips. Our mission is to empower you with knowledge, debunk myths, and provide you with clinical insights. This podcast is provided as an educational resource for healthcare practitioners only. This podcast represents the views and opinions of the host and their guests and does not represent the views or opinions of Designs for Health, Inc. This podcast does not constitute medical advice. The statements contained in this podcast have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products mentioned are not intended to diagnose treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, let's embark on a journey towards optimal well-being, one conversation at a time. Here's your host, Evelyn Lambrecht. Welcome to Conversations for Health. Today, we're talking about an integrative approach to eye health with Dr. Ronnie Vanek. Dr. Ronnie, welcome. Thank you so much, Evelyn. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited for this conversation. Dr. Ronnie Vonick is a board-certified neuro-ophthalmologist. She completed her MD at Brown University, residency at UC Irvine, and fellowship at Wilmer Eye Institute. She runs a private practice based in New York City and is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Mount Sinai. Dr. Ronick is also certified in integrative and functional medicine. She focuses on the root cause of eye diseases and uses strategies based on nutrition, botanicals, lifestyle modification, as supplements for vision issues such as macular degeneration, dry eye, cataract, glaucoma, as well as migraines. She is the author of two best-selling books, Beyond Carrots, Best Foods for Eye Health, A to Z, and Dr. Ronnie's Plant-Based Visionary Kitchen. Amazing. I read your book. And I found it very inspiring. And, you know, eye health is something we, that we don't always think about, especially if there aren't any issues. But we know that when there are issues, it just affects everything, right? So you're an ophthalmologist and neuro-ophthalmologist and then became a patient of functional medicine yourself. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I went through the traditional route. Um, I went to medical school in the U.S. I did internship, residency, fellowship, and I was actually working full-time in academics for the first part of my career. And I thought that was what I was going to do until I retired. But what happened was I developed a medical issue myself that really became quite challenging. And that's how I discovered functional medicine. So um, I had developed migraine headaches and I developed them initially back in my mid twenties, early thirties, but it wasn't so bad. I would get maybe one episode every two years. It was very manageable. I knew what it was. It would come and go. But then I was going through a very stressful period in my life um, in my early forties and everything was kind of happening at once. Um, both at home and at work. And I just, it was so stressful. And I developed migraines like very regularly. And then it became every day. So if you've ever had a migraine, you know how debilitating it can be, but imagine like waking up with it every morning, going to bed with it every night and just nonstop day after day. And then those days turned into weeks and then into months and into years. So I had migraine for several years and I tried everything. I tried all the traditional medical therapies, nothing was working. I went to some of the top doctors here in New York City, headache doctors, and you know, they just kept giving me prescription after prescription and nothing helped or gave me side effects. And finally I said, you know what? I need to take this into my own hands. And I started to research and I realized, oh my goodness, like there's so much written about supplements, for example. How come none of my doctors ever told me about that? You know, take some supplements. And then I think the most eye-opening moment was when I was talking to a colleague and he'd actually been trained in functional medicine. And he said, Ronnie, why don't you try an elimination diet? And I said, what, what do you mean? Like, what's that? What's an elimination diet? And, um, you know, I think now nowadays it's probably become more commonplace and most people do know what an, an elimination diet is. But back then I had no clue. And so he explained it to me. You know, you, you, this is, you know, you remove certain foods that may be pro-inflammatory, um, that may be triggering your symptoms. And so I was really fascinated. I was like, wow, how come none of my doctors ever talked to me about my diet? And meanwhile, I'm, I cringe to think this, like I was eating so poorly, Evelyn. It was just horrible. Every day I was eating pizza, ice cream, and diet cherry Coke. That was wow. my diet for like <laughs> day in, day out. It's really bad. And I never once thought, oh my goodness, maybe what I'm eating is contributing to my 
you know, my persistent headaches. And, and, um, and then I did decide to do an elimination diet. I also went to my first functional medicine training. Um, and I was really blown away. I was like, wow, I was never taught any of this in medical school. Like why, like, why are we never taught about nutrition? Why are we never taught about all these lifestyle strategies? So I loved it. And it ended up that I, it drew me in so much. Um, and it helped me so much in my own health journey that I ended up getting certified in functional medicine. So I now use all of these principles with my patients also, because I am a, a testament to how effective they can be, but also I've seen it in my patients. I've seen them turn around their problems with the power of nutrition and lifestyle and supplements. So that's a long answer to your question, but um, it, I think it definitely is something that many people can relate to who have discovered functional medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the story of a lot of practitioners who practiced in conventional medicine and then found functional medicine the same way. You know, it was some issue that they had themselves. Um, what were some of the changes that you saw in your patients once you started implementing functional medicine into your ophthalmology practice? And do your do any of your colleagues also practice this way in ophthalmology? Not to my knowledge. I think the last I checked, I'm like one of maybe two board certified ophthalmologists around the country who are also dually trained in functional medicine. Wow. Um, there may be others that I don't know about, but um most ophthalmologists, again, don't, they still haven't even really heard about functional medicine. They may have heard about integrative medicine or holistic approaches, but the, the term functional medicine is, I think it's gaining uh, relevance amongst patients. And then hopefully the medical community will also mm -hmm. better uh, appreciate it and understand its benefits. But, um, you know, to answer your first question, you know, what changes did I see? So I first used the strategies for my migraine patients and being a neuro-ophthalmologist, I actually have a lot of migraine patients. So I'm both a patient, but I'm also a doctor with, you know, who specializes in migraine. So I saw people turn around their symptoms, um, people with chronic migraine who had migraine for like 50 years, she was, I had this one patient, I'll share her story with you. She was in her seventies and she came to me because her, her niece was also my patient. And she said, you know, I've had migraine. I can't leave the house. I'm so debilitated. Like I have no life. Basically I have to be in the dark all the time. I've tried everything. Nothing's working. And so I said, okay, let's try this. So I put her on a regimen of supplements. I really talked to her about her lifestyle, her stressors, how she was managing the stress, her sleep. Um, and then we put a plan together for her and nutrition also was, was a cornerstone of her treatment. And I said, I'm not really sure if this is going to work for you, but try this. It worked for me. Try this regimen, do it for six weeks and then come back and see me. And she came back and she was like a new person. Uh, when she was first come, when she first came and she was wearing dark, dark sunglasses because she couldn't tolerate bright lights. She was vibrant. She was, you know, talking to me. She had no sunglasses. And she said, Dr. Bannock, you literally gave me back my life. Like now I can go out. I can enjoy time with my friends. I can go to a restaurant. I can go shopping. She's like, thank you so much for introducing me to some of these principles because I never would have known. And none of my other doctors mentioned them to me. So um, after I saw benefits from my migraine patients, I was like, well, maybe this can be applied to eye health also. Let's, let me give it a try. So I, you know, I started implementing some of these strategies for my patients with chronic eye issues. Like for example, macular degeneration is probably one of the biggest areas in which I've seen benefits. People with macular degeneration, they tend to be older. They have this relentless progression of disease where they lose their central vision. They can become legally blind. And right now for the earliest stages of the stages of the of disease, there really is no treatment that's effective. No medication or surgery or other procedure has been shown to be effective. So I said, let's talk about diet and lifestyle and supplements. And so I put patients on these regimens and I've been able to help people maintain their central vision, maintain 2020 vision, even despite having early signs of macular degeneration, even despite having a strong family history of macular degeneration, where both parents are blind from the disease. So it really, in my experience, it really works. And my goal now is to get this information out there to not just patients, but also my colleagues, because I think by educating them, then they can use these strategies for their patients as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And so obviously a big thing that you do in your practice is eye exams, right? Eyes are the window into the soul, but they're also a window into the body. So with these different eye conditions, what are some of the things that you're able to see from an eye exam that relates to overall body health? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Evelyn. So the way I think of it, the eye is like a canary in the coal mine. The eye, you know, it's, it's, even though we don't really think about our eyes too much, we kind of think they're separate from the rest of the body. They're very intimately connected to all, every, basically every other organ system. So if there's disease going on in another organ system, it will sometimes first show up in the eyes. And I'll give you a couple of, exa of examples. For example, diabetes. Um, we know that diabetes can wreak havoc on other organs, but uh, in the eye, it's one of the earliest changes that we see of diabetes are changes in the retina that we call diabetic retinopathy. There can be areas of bleeding. There can be areas of um, protein or fluid that's leaking out. I like to call it like a leaky eye syndrome. Many people have you know, heard of the term leaky gut or leaky brain, but this is a type of leaky eye syndrome um, that causes diabetic retinopathy. So we can pick up diabetes. We can pick up high blood pressure. We can pick up heart issues. Like for example, clots in the heart. We can uh, pick them up from an eye exam because sometimes they can travel. They can migrate into the back of the eye. We can pick up a lot of neurologic conditions also because the eye is a direct extension of the brain. So um, for example, sometimes I'm the first doctor to pick up something like multiple sclerosis in a patient, or even there are some early signs of Parkinson's disease that can be picked up on an eye exam. So I would say there are probably at least 200 different medical conditions that can be picked up on an eye exam. It's really incredible to think that we have this window into our health and many people don't realize it. Wow. That's really, really amazing. We should all go get our eyes checked. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. And actually it's recommended um, after the age of 40, everyone should go every one to two years to get your eyes checked because a lot of these conditions, initially they have no symptoms. And the only way you would know is to get the eye exam, but also get a dilated eye exam. So be sure to ask for that for a dilated eye exam. And why is that? So the dilation, it's when the doctor puts drops into your eyes yeah. to make your pupils really big. And a lot of people say, oh, can I please just skip that? I don't want to mm -hmm. get it done. It's annoying. My vision's blurry. But that's really how we can get a full view of what's going on in the retina and the optic nerve. And that gives us really so much more information than uh, a regular eye exam without the dilating drops would give us. Gotcha. I'm curious too, when it comes to blood pressure, what is it that you look for in an eye exam? So in the retina in the back of the eye, um, I actually pull out my eye model here to show you because um, I love using visuals. So when we look at the eye, we usually just see like the very front part of the eye, the white part. You can see the cornea, which is the curved clear part in the front. But if you open up the eye, and I'm going to open this up here and show you what's inside, there is a lot going on. There are a lot of different structures inside the eye, but particularly here, this orange here is rep is representing the retina. And normally the retina is clear, but we're seeing it as orange because there's blood vessels underneath. But you see all these blood vessels in the retina. And so we can pick up changes in those blood vessels. We can pick up when there's elevated blood pressure because the, the caliber of those blood vessels changes. It becomes very thin, what we call attenuated. Sometimes we can see hemorrhages along the blood vessels, lipid or... or um, uh, fats that have been leaked that have leaked out of the blood vessels into the retina that can sometimes happen with high blood pressure. So there are a lot of changes we can see, and sometimes even the optic nerve can get swollen from high blood pressure. So there's there's certain warning signs that we look for, and if we see them, we you know first of all we tell our patients we do see some. Um, findings in the back of your eye and you do need to go see your primary care doctor or maybe your cardiologist. So we work very closely with other providers to help um, really coordinate the patient's care based off of what we find on the exam. That's great. Thank you. And if you are listening to this podcast, you can watch the video if you want to see that demo. We have that on our website. So in your book, you talk about 30 different nutrients that we need for eye health. It sounds like a lot, but what are the broader categories of these nutrients? It does sound like a lot. And don't worry, you don't have to count them out whether you're getting all of them or not. But just if you think in large categories and you rotate through your foods, you will be able to supply your eyes with the nutrients they need. So the three categories are um, antioxidants, 
number one. Number two, um, nutrients that support mitochondrial function and energy production. And then number three, anti-inflammatory nutrients. So those are kind of the big categories that we need to think about for our eyes. And you know, a lot of people think, oh, eyes, nutrition, carrots, isn't that enough? You know, carrots, if I just eat enough carrots, if I get enough beta carotene in my diet, won't that be sufficient? But the truth is it's not. Um, yes, beta carotene is helpful. It's important, but it's not the only nutrient we need. I think it's interesting too. Obviously we think of mitochondrial health, well, all over our bodies, but our brains need a lot of energy. But I think sometimes even as practitioners, we don't think about the fact that our eyes require so much energy, right? So how important the mitochondrial health is for eye health. Yes. And so um, the brain uses a lot of our energy, our mitochondrial, you know, our body's mitochondrial needs, like 25% goes to brain function, but the eye is actually perhaps even more metabolically active than the brain, especially the retina, because the retina is constantly um, taking in light energy, processing that light energy into chemical signals to send to the brain. So that constant processing, there's always a turnover of cells in the retina and it's very, very energy demanding. So mitochondria are key for, for our, for your retina, but also for the optic nerve. And these general categories of nutrients, are they the same, whether you're working with somebody with a cataract or glaucoma or macular degeneration or dry eyes? Is it kind of the same for everybody or are there certain ones that help more for certain conditions? Yeah. So the base nutrients are all the same because again, our eyes, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, the eye is small, you know, it's, it's about the size of a golf ball in reality, but you know, they don't realize the complexity of the eye. So within the eye, there are actually at least 40 different structures. So those 30 nutrients are designed to support all 40 structures. But if you have a specific eye condition, like let's say for example, um, dry eye, you had mentioned earlier, dry eye. So dry eye is when the very surface of the eye, the cornea dries out. And usually there's an insufficiency of healthy oils on the surface of the cornea. And so we have to support our oils that are come from glands in the eyelids that secrete these oils. So omegas are very, very important for that. So that's one example where you may want to eat for, you know, for your general eye health, but you may really want to focus on specifically the omegas and not just omega-3s. This is really important. It's not just the omega-3 DHA EPA that we oftentimes hear about, but some of the other lesser known omegas. For example, there's an omega-6 called GLA or gamma linolenic acid. That's also been shown to help with dry eye. Um, so that's an omega you may want to include either if you can get it from your diet, but also from supplementation to support your eyes. And then, um, there's also omega-7. Omega-7, it's getting a lot more attention now when it comes to dry eye. And omega-7 has very specific dietary sources. And if you're not able to get them from those dietary sources, then again, you may want to take a supplement to get that. And omega-9 as well, which is oleic acid, which comes from olive oil. So if you think about it, it's not just focusing on a pun intended, focusing on, on <laughs> one specific nutrient for one specific part of the eye. It's more having a diversity of various nutrients to support all parts of the eye. That's really important to understand. Yeah. Since you mentioned dry eyes, how bad is it to use eye drops? Or is it fine? <laughs> it, yeah, it's not bad at all. I know okay. um, many people probably have heard the warnings, especially last year. There were a lot of warnings because there were a lot of drops, specifically generic drops that were mm -hmm. recalled. They were over 27 drops that were recalled by the FDA because they were contaminated. So I know there's been a lot of you know fear. Oh, should I use eye drops? Should I not use eye drops? And my recommendation is if you have dry eye, absolutely use drops to re-moisturize and lubricate your eyes, but make sure your drops are coming from a reputable manufacturer. You can also go to the FDA website and see which specific drops were recalled. Again, most of them were generics or retail generics. So some of the large retail brands, all of their drops were recalled because of issues with contamination or some of the bottles had like plastic pieces in them or even glass in them. So it was really kind of a scary time. So just make sure that you're getting your um, your drops from a trusted manufacturer that is that has good quality control practices in place. Thank you. So let's talk about the nutrients a little bit more in detail. So let's get into some of the vitamins. Uh, first of all, um, vitamin A is a big one. You mentioned it with carrots. Does the form of vitamin A matter 
What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, there's two types of vitamin A, um, preformed vitamin A and pro vitamin A. And so if you have um, animal products in your diet, you're probably getting um, the um, preformed vitamin A in your from your diet. But if you don't eat animal products, then you're getting the pro vitamin A, which then has to be converted into vitamin A. And also beta carotene is a type of um carotenoid that can be converted into vitamin A as well. And there's an, a, an enzyme called beta carotene monooxygenase that converts that beta carotene into vitamin A. And some people have genetic variations like SNPs that have, that give them different uh, function for that, you know, beta carotene monooxygenase enzyme. So depending on your diet, you know, what type of diet you prefer, but also depending on your genetic makeup, um, you may not be able to convert some of the other forms of vitamin A into the active form of vitamin A that's necessary for your diet. So this is something that I do work with my patients to help them understand and also to help them you know, tease out, okay, which form of vitamin A is best for you and how can we optimize that bioavailability for you? So um, it is important to realize that not all vitamin A's are the same. So thank you for bringing that up. And what are some of the other important vitamins for eye health? I would say the most important class are the macular carotenoids. And many people may have heard of them before, lutein and zeaxanthin. There's also a third one called mesozeaxanthin. Um, they're carotenoids, they're cousins to beta carotene, they're cousins to vitamin A, um, cousins to things like lycopene, et cetera. But they're very unique for eye health because these nutrients, now this is really fascinating. I, I love this, you know, how the body is developed to protect itself. So these carotenoids, our bodies can't make them, but we can get them from certain foods or we can get them from supplementation. Our body takes them, deposits them into the retina in the back of the eye, into the macula. And I'll pull out my eye model again for this part. Um, again, there's lots of different parts here, so I'll just show you. So this is the front of the eye. The light rays come in through the pupil and hit the retina in the back of the eye. And see this yellow spot here? This is called the fovea. And this is responsible for our central 2020 vision. So if you don't have a healthy fovea, fovea, you won't be able to see perfectly clearly 2020. And so these um, uh, carotenoids, their, their pigments, they get deposited right here. And that's why it's a yellow spot because these pigments are naturally orange, yellow in color. And um, preferentially they get deposited here. And the, the whole purpose of this is to protect the retina. So these macul the three macular carotenoids, again, lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, these serve as our natural antioxidants, our natural UV blockers, and our natural blue blockers. So many people don't realize that we have natural protective mechanisms against blue light built into our eyes. And um, if you get enough of these carotenoids, you can pre protect your eyes against eye strain. You can protect your eyes against macular degeneration. Um, um, they're just such important nutrients that we absolutely have to get in our diets. And in terms of, you know, I'll give you some numbers. Um, it's estimated that we need about 6.5 to 20 milligrams of lutein a day. And most people are getting less than that, a lot less than that, only one or two milligrams a day. So most people are severely deficient in these eye nutrients. Um, so I strongly people urge people to kind of be aware of them and try to improve their, um, their intake just from their regular diet and then maybe take a supplement as well. Yeah, I have a lot of follow-up questions because you just mentioned so much. So I remember reading in your book that in Fiji, the average person, I think it's 25 milligrams of lutein daily. Yes. That's really, yeah. really interesting. The highest popu you know, in, in terms of intake, they, they definitely are the highest population. So they probably don't need to take a supplement, but for the <laughs> rest of us. <laughs> yeah. And what is it specifically about UV rays and blue light that is so damaging to the eye? Yeah, that's a great question. So these wavelengths are on the shorter end of the spectrum and uh, UV light we can't see, but these are really, really ultra short wavelength um, rays and they can penetrate into the deeper structures of the eye, into the retina and cause oxidative damage and free radical damage. So that's why these particular wavelengths, we definitely need to protect against. And these 
these pigments, these carotenoids can help us do that. You, and blue light is basically, it's visible light. So it's part of the rainbow of colors that our eyes can see, but it's on the short end of the rainbow spectrum. And so because it's on the short end, it's definitely shorter wavelengths. Again, they can penetrate into the retina and they are just so high in energy that they can really cause a lot of damage. And um, blue light exposure can, again, there are studies that have, sh have shown that too much blue light exposure, especially from screens or even from too much sunlight exposure can cause um, uh, issues with the retina. It doesn't cause blindness. I just want to, you know, I want to uh, re reassure people that if you're looking at your screen all day, or if you're looking at the sun too much, it's not going to lead you to go, bl to go blind, but definitely it can cause short-term issues um, with our vision health. Interesting. Okay. You just made me want to jump to something else. So I know that um, it's popular right now to want to look into the sun in the morning, right? Get that sunlight into our eyeballs. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this as an ophthalmologist? I strongly advise against it. I know that there are many people who, you know, they want to wake up early, get their vitamin D, soak up that sunshine. It's great for your skin. It's great to, you know, set your circadian rhythm, but directly staring at the sun is quite dangerous, actually, because those UV rays, particularly UVA, UVB rays, can penetrate through various different structures in the eye, get to the retina, and cause burns in the retina, thermal burns in the back of the eye. And once there's a burn there, there is scarring, there's permanent damage that can happen, and people can develop patchy loss of their central vision. So imagine you're trying to look at something or trying to read, and there are these patchy areas that are just missing because you have damage to the retina. So wow. I know, again, this is a, t a popular trend to do sun gazing because people want to set their circadian rhythm. But the reality is simply by keeping your eyes open during the daylight hours, you are getting enough stray rays to set your circadian rhythm. And so if you do want to do you know, um, early morning sunlight exposure, I would say go outside by all means, get that UV to your skin, but wear sun protection while you're doing it. And don't look directly at the sun. If you do really, really, really want to look directly at the sun, do it with your eyelids closed. So just close your eyes and then uh, those rays will still penetrate through your eyelids and let your body know, let your retinal ganglion cells know, let your pineal gland know that yes, it's time to wake up and it's time you know, to get going with the day. So you can still get the benefits, but keep your eyelids closed to protect that either your retina. It's really, really important. Interesting. Um, so going back to the lutein and zeaxanthin that are in the eye, can you actually measure those concentrations in the eye? We can. So we have um, a special camera technology to measure. You can, you can measure the pigments in your skin as well. You can do skin carotenoid mm -hmm. testing, but that doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on in the retina. So there is a way, there are several ways to measure these, uh, the carotenoid concentration in the retina. Now um, it's called macular pigment optical density or MPOD. And this test is not routinely available. So if you go to your local optometrist or ophthalmologist, they probably don't have the instrumentation to do this test. It's really used as a research tool. Um, but we do know that as people get older, their MPOD levels start to decline. And um, the best way to, you know, to keep them high, keep the levels up is to include foods that are rich in lutein and zeaxanthin in your diet or or and or to take a supplement. It's really, really important. And as those levels decline, that's when the risk of age-related eye diseases like, for example, macular degeneration goes up. We know there's a direct correlation to lower levels of lutein and zeaxanthin levels in the retina and higher risks for macular degeneration and loss of vision. And when somebody starts either supplementing with lutein and zeaxanthin or eating more of those in foods, do you notice like it takes days, weeks, months for it to help with vision? Yeah. So it's not an immediate effect because you have to replenish your stores, but I would say within um, anywhere from one to three months, studies have shown that plasma levels start to rise and to get to a really good level. So you do have to do it consistently. So don't just take, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I took the supplement for a week and 
it didn't really <laughs> make a difference. So I stopped and I said, well, your body takes time to replenish its stores. So keep going, do it consistently for three months and also make sure you're getting the nutrition from foods as well. So it's important to do both, not just rely only on the supplement because yes, you can do that, but it's really best to get some of these nutrients in the way that nature intended from natural foods. And the good news is there's so many foods out there that can help provide us our eyes with lutein and zeaxanthin. Um, this is, you know, what I really try to focus on in the book is there is a diversity of different foods. Like, for example, I'll, I'll just list a couple of them. Yes, that was um, my next question. <laughs> yeah, leafy greens are really, I would say, in terms of um, carot macular carotenoid content, leafy greens really are at the top of the list. So spinach, kale, collard greens, Swiss chard, uh, romaine lettuce, those are amazing sources. Uh, but let's say you don't like the taste of leafy greens, you find them a little too bitter. Let's say you're, you have sen you have sensitivity to oxalates, which are compounds that are found in high concentrations in leafy greens. The good news is there are many other foods that you can turn to, to get your lutein and zeaxanthin intake. So um, egg yolk is a wonderful source. You know, that beautiful orange yellow color of the egg yolk is because it's high in lutein and zeaxanthin. Uh, I know a lot of people have taken to throwing out the egg yolk and just having the egg whites, but please, please, please don't do that. Make sure to have your egg yolk. And then um, other fruits and vegetables that are orange or yellow in color, for example, uh, I love this, orange peppers and yellow pe bell peppers. Many people immediately when they you know, think about using bell peppers in their food, in their meals, they turn to green, but orange and yellow have the highest lutein and zeaxanthin content along with corn, uh, which um, I know some people stay away from corn because they're concerned about um, you know, GMO corn, but you can always get non-GMO corn, but it's a wonderful source of lutein and zeaxanthin. And actually the scientific name for corn is zea maize. And that's mm -hmm. where the word zeaxanthin came from. It's actually came, oh. it came from corn. Um, so those are some great sources. Even some spices are good sources of lutein and zeaxanthin, like paprika. Um, that beautiful color of paprika is because it's high in lutein and zeaxanthin as well. Awesome. Well, my favorite is nasturtium flowers, but they only grow right now along the San Diego River. And I think I see them in patches, you know, all over San Diego. I don't know if they grow all over the country. They're spicy, but they are good. But obviously I can't get enough <laughs> of that to sustain me. I've actually, I think we were talking about this earlier, Evelyn. I actually had um, someone reach out to me and say, you know, she was diagnosed with uh, early stage macular degeneration. And she just started to have lots of edible flowers, including nasturtium and also marigold. Marigolds mm -hmm. are a wonderful source as well. Marigold petals, particularly the deep orange ones. Yep. She was able to turn her macular degeneration around. So her doctor, she went back to her ophthalmologist and he said, wow, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because those changes that were there before have basically reversed, which is incredible. Um, you know, that's, that's wonderful that, that she was able to do that. So I love the idea of edible flowers. Yeah, that's a really great story. Um, I know supplementally, one of the uh, biggest extracts that I see is Ludamax 2020. Um, so I'm curious about some of the research around this ingredient. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so Ludamax 2020 is a blend. It's a proprietary blend of all three of the macular carotenoids. So it's it's probably the the most commonly used um, branded ingredient out there in most supplements that provide uh, lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin. Um, also in Ludamax 2020, the ratio is the way is is designed so that it's uh, allows for the best absorb. Uh, bioavailability, the way nature intended uh, for these macular carotenoids to be provided to our eyes um, and the rest of our bodies as well. And there is um, the company that makes Ludamax 2020, they actually are heavily based in science. So they run a lot of clinical trials, um, looking at the benefits. So there are quite a few clinical trials out there showing the benefits of Ludamax 2020 for eye health, eye strain, um, um, eye fatigue, uh, they just did a study in kids, which is amazing, in children, school-aged children, using Ludamax 2020 to help with their um, their um, screen fatigue, et cetera. And there's also studies looking at brain health, uh, so cognitive benefits of Ludamax 2020. So it's my go-to ingredient. Uh, so whenever you're looking for an eye health supplement, always look for that particular ingredient on the label. We know our kids need that. <laughs> Yes. Screen time is rampant. Yeah. Did yeah. you know Evelyn, that um, 
Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to ask you how many hours do you think a typical a, a typical adult in the U.S. spends on a screen? Well, I know how Take many it. I spend, and it's embarrassing. I guess it Take depends it. on the kind of job you have. I don't know, eight. Yeah, More? so ten actually <laughs> higher. Yeah, it's higher, and so the this study came out before the pandemic, and it was ten hours thirty six minutes was the average, which is Ooh. crazy to think. And that was pre-pandemic. So now I know that number's probably gone up quite a bit. A lot of us are still maybe working from home. Kids are on screens all day. So for adults, it was over 10 hours. For children, it was about six hours a day on a screen. Wow. Which is really, that's a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot. And it can definitely take a toll on our eyes. And that's why you really need to provide your eyes with that blue light protection in the form of the macular carotenoids. More than ever, really yeah. important. And I love it too, that there is research showing it also helps with cognitive health. And I believe there are studies on skin health too. There's a lot of crossover between eye health and skin health nutrients. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Since you mentioned blue light a couple of times, I actually would love to ask you about blue light glasses really quick. So the ones that have a light filter, not orange glasses, is that something that people should be wearing all day if they're on a computer? Or just at night before going to bed? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's one of the most common questions I get from my mm -hmm. patients is number one, should I buy blue blockers? Yeah. And then the two, like which brands are the best to buy? So um, my answer to that is if you can get enough of these carotenoids in your diet, um, the macular carotenoids, and if you're maybe taking a supplement, you may not necessarily need to have that those blue blocking glasses. Mm. That's number one. Number two is if you do have a lot of eye strain and fatigue, despite, you know, doing supplementation and diet, then yes, you may consider doing a blue blocker, but the tint is really important. So you were alluding to this earlier is if you have a light tint, whether it looks clear or if it looks you know, like a slight light yellow tint, that is probably not, those glasses are not blocking much of the blue light. So um, it's probably, those glasses are probably blocking only about 10 to 30% of the blue light. And so if you wanted to have just a little bit of something during the day, you can certainly wear them. But at nighttime, that's probably not sufficient to protect your eyes mm -hmm. at nighttime and um, protect your eyes basically from the adverse sleep effects of too much blue light, particularly later in the day. So if you're working late into the night, you want to get some good blue blocking glasses, I would suggest getting a deeper, deeper tint. So either a deep orange or amber or deep, deep red. Um, and the way you know how much blue light it's blocking is, yes, you can ask your optician, you know, how much blue light does this really block? But a simple test you can do is you can put them on and you can look at your screen and you're looking for the color blue on your screen. And if you can still see blue pretty well, you know that those blue blockers are probably not blocking that much of the blue light versus if you wear some of the deeper tinted blue blockers, again, red or orange or amber, when you put those on, you don't see any blue light at all. So you know that those blue blockers are probably blocking about 98 or more percent, 98 to hundred percent of the blue light coming from your screen. So keep that in mind. And Sometimes, you know, even though I try to work on my diet and I take a supplement, um, I still do feel some fatigue. So sometimes I do have, I do wear blue blockers myself and I have different pairs for different needs or different times of the day. So you can have, you know, maybe two different types of blue blockers, depending on what your needs are and switch them up depending on the time of day. Um, the other thing I really love is there is a, an app. There's a screen filter app that you can download to your computer, which is um, very sophisticated. It knows where you are geographically. So it knows what time the sun is rising and what time the sun is setting. And so it can, um, it can mirror the natural uh, amount of blue light coming from the sun on your screen. So it can adjust the amount of blue light coming from your screen, depending on what time of day it is. And so it's called Iris. Um, you can download it to your computer, to your phone, to your tablet, basically any screen except a television, you can download it to, and you can try it out. And, um, and you'll see there are different modes you can play around with, and you can see like what your eyes feel most comfortable with, but that's, with, but that's another great way to modulate the amount of blue light coming from your screen and to help um, improve your sleep as well. Thank you for that. I actually have not heard of Iris. I use Flux, but it sounds similar. 
yeah, it's, it's similar. Um, I actually prefer Iris because it has fun- uh, a lot more functionality built into oh. it. There are 27, at least, at least the last I checked, there are at least 27 different modes you can try, try play, right, playing around with. So they have a healthy mode, they have sleep mode, movie mode, gaming mode. So there's a lot of different, um, you know, permutations, combinations of the filters that you can apply on your screen. But Flux is wonderful as well. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about other types of supplements. So we talked a lot about the carotenoids. Let's talk about some of the antioxidants and bioflavonoids. Can you name some of them, like some of the most popular ones that you recommend and maybe foods that they're in and just some of the research in eye health on those? Yeah, absolutely. So bioflavonoids, um, they're abundant in nature. There's over 4,000 of them that have been identified in nature and they protect plants from disease from infection and oxidative stress. So when we eat them, they protect us as well. And there are studies to show that certain bioflavonoids can help protect retinal cells or retinal pigment epithelial cells. These are cells underneath the retina that keep, help to keep the retina healthy. Um, they can help protect the lens and the cornea. So a couple that I really love are quercetin, which um, is also very well known for its immune benefits, but it can also benefit eye health. There are studies to show that. Resveratrol, which comes, um, it's a deep pigment that comes from basically like red wine, grapes, cherries, et cetera, um, but that can also help protect the eye and help maybe even help uh, protect against glaucoma. Um, Then sulforaphane, which um, comes from, one of the wonderful sources of sulforaphane is broccoli, broccoli sprouts or broccoli seed extract. So um, I love trying to tell my, you know, educating my patients about how they can incorporate some of these um, plant derived um, compounds in their diet, but also maybe look for them specifically on the labels of supplements. If they're taking a supplement for their eye health, or maybe they're taking a multi, a multivitamin, make sure that your multi has some of these key bioflavonoids in it so that it's not just protecting your body and, you know, supporting your body and and other functions as well, but it's also protecting your eyes in a very deep, meaningful way. I think it's really important to try to boost your your eyes nutrient um, support system in every way possible. Yeah. And then what about some of the other um, supplements that you recommend? I know one of the categories in your book that you also talked about were the anti-inflammatories. And we talked about the omegas already. What are some of the others that you recommend to your patients? So I love um, vitamin D as an anti-inflammatory. Um, it's not just a uh, vitamin. It act- actually has so many functions in the body, it functions almost like a hormone almost. It's mm-hmm. anti-inflammatory. So I love um, getting my patients vitamin D levels up, boosting them with diet and also supplementation. And also um, curcumin, which comes from uh, turmeric. It's um, this commonly known as the spice turmeric, but curcumin has been shown to have many anti-inflammatory benefits for the eyes, uh, ranging from all different parts of the eye, the front of the eye, the cornea, the lens, the retina, the optic nerves. There are many, many potential different eye structures that can benefit from having curcumin. So those are my go-tos. But all the omegas, as we talked about earlier, DHA, EPA, GLA, those are also very helpful for vision health. Yeah. And can you name some of the biggest bang for your buck foods that you recommend to your patients? Yeah. The biggest um, would be, we talked about the leafy greens yeah. already, but also um, berries. I love berries because they, we didn't talk about this earlier. We we're talking about bioflavonoids, but there's another class of bioflavonoids called anthocyanins. Mm-hmm. And these produce um they're deep uh, pigments. So they um, they are found in deeply pigmented berries like blackberries, blueberries. You can even find them in uh, red berries like goji berries, raspberries, strawberries. But these pigments uh, have also been shown to protect our eyes, particularly the retina. So, um, so I would say, again, leafy greens, berries. And then um, I would say the third group, food group I would include are nuts. So nuts of all kinds. But um, if I had to choose one nut that I love the most, it's pistachio for your eyes. And it's because pistachio, not only does it have healthy fats, it has omega-3s, it has some um, omega-6s as well, but it also has lutein and zeaxanthin. So that greenish color of the pistachio is actually because of um, it's rich in lutein and zeaxanthin as well. Amazing. That's one nut I just don't really seem to ever eat. So ah, we'll have to change that. <laughs> yeah. But I know any kind of nut is wonderful. So cashews, yeah. 
cashews, almonds. Um, they're, they're also rich in vitamin E, which is also an, another important um, antioxidant for eye health, for prevention of cataracts, and also macular degeneration. Since we're talking about vitamin E, yes. uh, <laughs> um, I know a lot of people always ask, you know, is there a particular form of vitamin E that may be beneficial? And my go-to is also always tocotrienol. Um, there are different forms of tocopherols, tocotrienols, and but I love delta tocotrienol, delta and gamma combined uh, for eye health. There are some early studies looking um, mainly in animal models, but looking at cataracts and cataract prevention using tocotrienol. So we know that it's a very, very potent antioxidant. And there also may be some anti-angiogenic benefits of tocotrienol as well. So I think um, there may be some future studies looking into macular degeneration, perhaps even diabetic retinopathy using tocotrienol. So I love, I love that particular form of vitamin E. Very interesting. And with tocotrienols, we know that it helps with so many other things already. So it's great to hear that it's being studied more in eye health as well. In terms of making this simple for your patients, I think in your book, you said you encourage five cups of plant foods per day. When you tell your patients that, I mean, I think that most of the guests we've had on the show, like that's probably what they recommend to their patients, right? But I'm curious how you recommend it in the context of eye health and to encourage them to do it. Yeah, I have a very simple way to get your five cups in and actually not just throughout the day, but just all in one go. So this is a super quick hack you can do, um, incorporate into your daily routine is to have a green smoothie every day. And with the, within the smoothie, the simplest thing to do is you pack in three to five, three to four cups of leafy greens. You're getting about at least three cups right there and put in whatever leafy green you like. Um, then add in a cup to, of berries and then you can add in some seeds. So chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, whichever seeds you like there, um, they provide, um, ALA, which is a precursor to DHA and EPA. So you're getting some good omega threes there. You can add some protein powder. You can add, um, the milk of your choice, add some ice, maybe, you know, add some flavoring to it. And right in that one smoothie, you can easily get your, basically your five cups, your daily requirement right there. So super quick, super simple, and then you're done for the day and you're supporting your eyes, but also other parts of your body as well. You know, mm -hmm. the, a daily smoothie is great for your brain health. It's great for your skin health. It's great for migraine. So, um, so many other health benefits of doing a daily green smoothie every day. Yep. Smoothies for the win. Uh, yes. One more topic that I would love to cover is um, the AREDS studies, AREDS, A-R-E-D-S, age-related eye disease studies. So yes. what did those studies show? I think there were two sets of them. And um, why did they only show a 25% reduction in risk? I believe it was in, was it macular degeneration? Tell us more about those. Uh, so the ARED studies, these were two pivotal clinical trials in ophthalmology. They were sponsored by the National Eye Institute, which is part of the NIH. And they had each, each of the studies had over 4,000 patients in them. And wow. what the studies were looking to see is whether supplementation can help prevent two eye diseases, age-related macular degeneration and cataracts. So what they found was that they, were, they had a very specific formulation that they were working in with. So ARED's one had vitamin A, at a high dose, um, vitamin E, vitamin C, copper, and zinc. So basically, um, these select nutrients um, taken for, um, I forgot exactly how long it was, maybe a year or so. And um, and patients were, you know, examined to see if they were at risk for developing cataracts or macular degeneration. And so there was really no benefit that they found for cataracts, but for macular degeneration, they found that only a very specific subset of patients with AMD, which is the short form of macular degeneration, benefited only about 25% of people who had that particular type of macular degeneration benefited. So then the next phase of the study, AREDS2, what they did was they took out vitamin A because they were worried about it maybe causing lung cancer in smokers. So they took out vitamin A, they replaced vitamin A with lutein and zeaxanthin, and they mm -hmm. also added in DHA and EPA in some of their arms of the study. And what they found was that switching out for lutein zeaxanthin basically still conferred the same 25% reduced risk. So the question is, you know, why don't more people benefit? Mm 
Why is it that there's only such a limited number of people who benefit? And my thoughts, I have many thoughts about the ARED studies about why they didn't quite have as much um, protect or they didn't confer as much protection as what we would have liked, because it's not just six nutrients that we need to focus on. There are many more. So if you're only giving people a select number of ben, uh, nutrients, it's not really supporting their whole eye health, but also these studies were published in the um, mid 1990s, mid 1990s to early 2000s. And since then, we know that there are other nutrients that are also really, really important for retinal health including mesozeaxanthin, which is the third macular carotenoid that was not included in those studies. And we think that maybe meso is perhaps of the three macular carotenoids, the most important of the three. Also mm -hmm. astaxanthin, which is a nutrient that comes from marine algae, which is also a potent antioxidant. Maybe of all the antioxidants that are known to us, maybe the most potent of all the antioxidants. And you've probably heard of astaxanthin when it comes to skin health or maybe brain health, but it's also been shown to be beneficial for eye health as well. And, um, also, um, uh, I, I also really strongly think that the, one of the reasons why the AREDs didn't do quite so well was because it didn't have bioflavonoids in them. Mm. Um, so I think that's another key Im important group of uh, nutrients that were missing in AREDs and also didn't have tocotrienol. It had tocopherol, but it didn't have tocotrienol. So now they're planning for a third AREDs, the AREDs 3 study. Um, so I think this is going to probably be launched within the next few years. Um, I don't yet know what the formulation is that they're planning to include in that, but I'm, be cur I'm really curious to know whether it's going to have the mesozeaxanthin, whether it's going to have astaxanthin, whether it's going to have tocotrienol, and whether it's going to have the bioflavonoids as well. Do you get to have any input? Can you submit something to them? <laughs> well, I'm not directly involved. Um, there's a Dr. Emily Chu, who's been kind of the lead researcher in these studies, and mm -hmm. you know she been really you know important in, in um, designing the study and choosing the nutrients but I will definitely reach out to her and you know let my opinions kind of yeah. hopefully <laughs> be known um, you know I really have looked at a lot of the you know when I was writing the book I really looked at a lot of the research out there what's been published what's been shown what theoretically may benefit the eye and so um I just find that, you know, it, sometimes it's whatever is out there doesn't necessarily make it into human studies, but I really do hope that, you know, those nutrients that I mentioned, I do hope that they will make it into the third AREDs because I think those are the key um, missing links to uh, supporting complete eye health. Yeah. I thought there was something interesting too. I think you wrote about this in the book, but the study also gave people really high levels of zinc, like extraordinarily yes. high. How much was it? Yeah. 80 milligrams, both studies, AREDS 1 and AREDS 2. And, you know, it's really kind of shocking to think or to, re, you know, to, to hear that. Why is it 80 milligrams? The recommended maximum daily allowance per, for adults is 40 milligrams in the U.S. So they were doubling the amount of zinc that they were giving. And in it, because of that high level, they were also, had, they also had to give copper to make sure that copper mm -hmm. didn't get with those really, really high levels of zinc. And the other thing I'll tell you is that not all people can safely take that high level of zinc. There are actually two um, genetic variants that have been identified and people with macular degeneration that if they take a very, very high level of zinc, it actually increases their risk of macular degeneration. So not only may it, you know, it, it doesn't not, not just do anything. It actually makes them at higher risk for macular degeneration if they're having that 80 milligrams of zinc a day. Wow. So um, now some of the formulations have actually cut back on the zinc level because they realize that some people, for some people with macular degeneration, it may actually be toxic and harmful. So it's important to realize that and be mindful of those high levels. And in my practice, I actually test, um, I actually do genetic testing specifically to see if my patients have those specific variants, those markers. And if they do, then I really limit the amount of zinc that they're getting um, from supplementation because you don't want to overdo it with that, that important nutrient. Very, very interesting. Do you know what those SNPs are off the top of your head? Um, yes. Complement factor H and ARMS2. So, interesting. <laughs> Can I go look yes. at my raw data? <laughs> <laughs> there's one more. Yeah. I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's actually three. Okay. Three, three genetic variants. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to transition to some questions that we ask every guest on the podcast. And I think I know the answers, but what are your top three supplements that you personally take? 
Yeah. So I take, um, first of all, I take my eye health supplement, which includes the three macular carotenoids, astaxanthin, berry extracts, and tocotrienol. And then I take a multi, which has everything a normal multi would have, but it has those bioflavonoids that we talked about earlier. And then I take, um, I take an omega supplement as well. So those are my go-tos. And because I have migraine, I actually have a separate one I take as well that includes specific nutrients for migraine, including magnesium and riboflavin and a couple of other things like fever a few. Nice. And um, what are your top health practices for your personal health and well-being? I feel like you've come a long way since <laughs> those early days of pizza uh, and Coke. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I would say making the, the biggest thing that made the difference for me was in, it was changing around the amount of fruits and vegetables I had in my diet. So before I had basically none, like hardly any fresh fruits and fruits and vegetables. Now I try to get at least five cups in a day, oftentimes more than that, seven or nine cups a day. Um, the other thing is exercising regularly. So I really was not doing that um, during that period in my life. So I make it a really a priority now is to exercise regularly at least, um, three times a week to get my heart rate up, um, to keep my, uh, my heart health and, you know, um, support that. And then the third thing is stress modulation. So I know, you know, many people have stress from various different aspects of their lives, whether it's stress at home or stress at work or stress with their health, but it is important to find ways to try to modulate and mitigate that stress. And so you can better be able to deal with it. So I think it's really, so for me, it's taking long walks, it's doing some meditation, it's doing yoga. Um, these are my go-tos for stress relief, but everybody has to find what may work for them and help support them in a very, um, uh, foundational way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is something that you've changed your mind about through all of your years in practice? So one thing that really, um, I've learned is that one, it's not a one size fits all for everyone. It's not that what works for one person is going to work for everyone. So you have to find your own, um, path and, you know, whether it's your diet, whether it's supp your supplement regimen, whether it's your lifestyle routine, find what works best for you. Because again, even it could be, you could have an identical twin and it may work for you, but it may not work for them. So it really is a very individual journey to find what works best for you to, and res you have to resonate with that for, to really support you. Yeah. Great points. Ronnie, thank you so much for being here. Where can practitioners learn more about you and your practice? Thank you for having me. And I love sharing all this information. Um, you can find out a lot more about what I do and my, my, you know, what, uh, my philosophies are and my, my mission through my website, which is, um, www.drronniebannock.com. Also, if you're on Instagram, I do post a lot of tips, eye health tips, as well as migraine tips on Instagram. And I have a YouTube channel as well, where I have a lot of educational videos. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much again for sharing your knowledge. And it's so great to have you as an ophthalmologist sharing this information and implementing functional medicine. It's very inspiring. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Conversations for Health. Check out the show notes for resources from our conversation today. Please share this podcast with your colleagues. Follow, rate, or leave a review wherever you listen or watch. And thank you for designing a well world with us. This is Conversations for Health with Evelyn Lambrecht, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based cutting-edge research and practical tips.